Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. This is a Currents episode. Currents are shorter and less heavily produced than our full-length episodes and generally focus on a single topic. As always, links to books, articles, and organizations mentioned are available on the episode page at jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Rob Malda. Back in the day, he was known by his slash dot handle Commander Taco, and he tells me he's still known by that. Uh, he was the guy, along with one of his buddies, who started the famous website slash dot. You know, back in uh, you know, way back yonder, it was uh, absolutely must read when I was uh, CTO of Thompson, now Thompson Reuters, they say about 1999 onward. Uh, I checked it every day when I was CEO of uh, Network Solutions and we were involved with the ICANN wars. Uh, it was, again, absolute must read. So uh, interesting how I happened to invite Rob on the show. In fact, I'd call it some synchronicity. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking with my friend Peter Wang, who's the CEO of Anaconda, the Python tools company, about moderation systems of the past and what they might have uh, with respect to lessons for the future. And I mentioned uh, then Slashdot, and I mentioned how it had had a very interesting and unusual rating system going on. And uh, frankly, I said I had no idea whether Flash uh, Slashdot still existed. And Peter assured me that it did. Then last week, I saw Rob musing on Twitter about writing a history of Slashdot. And while I'm supposed to be on a six-month break from social media, I, where am I now? I guess I'm... Uh, halfway through month three, I still do one screen a week just to get a zeitgeist of the vibe on the net. So, so I just happened to see that. I guess some, one of my friends happened to like it or share it or something. So I, uh, I said, shit, you know, two uh, signals in a row in seven days, got to be something there. So I reached out to him and said, hey, Rob, hey, you can start talking about the history of slash dot here. So Rob, how you doing? I am well. That's a good thing. It's the craziest of all years. So let me start with the obvious first question. Where the hell did the handle Commander Taco come from? So Commander Taco is a reference to a Dave Barry quote. Uh, a, he wrote a book, I don't know, probably in the 80s, uh, maybe 90s. Uh, uh, and it was like a, a joke dating guide. And the Commander Taco was the name of a restaurant that you should never take a first date. Hmm. Now, in my hometown, it was quite common to take uh, a first date to Jack in the Box at 2 o'clock in the morning for the nastiest, greasiest tacos ever. I guess we didn't read that book. There you go. How about that? So that's, we're going to talk about Slashdot today. So what, how did it start? What was the deal? What, what the hell were you guys doing when you launched it? Yeah, we didn't know either. Uh, so Slashdot started, uh, like, let's say 1997. It grew out of, uh, I was working at an ad agency as a part-time job building websites. Uh, I was in college at the time and at, in 19, let's say 1995, 1996, nobody knew how to write HTML. Uh, and I hung out with graphic designers and I was an engineer and uh, I hung out in IRC chat rooms and Usenet message boards and was writing what would in 2020 be commonly known as a blog. But in 1996, 1995, had no name. It was just a homepage. Uh, and uh, all of those things just sort of swirled together. And over the course of uh, a couple of years there, I built the Slashdot thing. Cool. And uh, as I recall, the... Uh the, the software that you ran on has always been open source. Is that, was that correct? I don't know if it's always been open source, but it was definitely open sourced after, after a time, the first couple of versions of it were not anything shippable. Okay. Uh, they were, you know, hodgepodge Perl scripts duct taped together. Uh, but uh, uh, after a few years, we made a concerted effort to release the whole platform as an open source package and lots of websites uh, in the early, uh, early noughties uh, ran it. It was called slash uh, there was uh, a number of sites that were of varying degrees of popularity that used our code, uh, although I don't think that any of them 
uh, really plumbed the depths the way we did. It wasn't really a useful application for most people because it was itself highly tuned for our specific use case, which was a pretty large population and a lot of the weird code that made it difficult for noobs to install was basically built around us building a scalable platform, both in terms of the available hardware that we had, like average folks didn't have, you know, 15 servers to host it on. But also, we were constantly dealing with trolls. So a lot of the code in the system was uh, the moderation system. Uh, and those were not the, the, the system was overly complex if you didn't have our problems. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. Uh, back in 2013, I uh, was part of a project where we put up a community system board that we thought was going to get bigger than it did. And we foolishly uh, took a fork of the Reddit so uh, source code. Oh, you and it, it had the same issue. It had, you know, massive back end scaling potential, which we thought we were going to need. Well, guess what? We missed that by two orders of magnitude. Oh, well. And so it was a disproportionate pain in the ass from a uh, DevOps perspective and from an operational perspective. Uh, but it was fun nonetheless. Uh, and I actually still have that code. I know it's no longer available. Uh, but so if anybody ever needs a copy of uh, the Reddit source code from 2013, including a bunch of cool enhancements, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, should I ever find a desire to build up another, uh, site? Yeah, the code is not bad, uh, but I would also say it is not good. It's somewhere in between, if you know what I mean. Right? I have a feeling that uh, it was developed uh, under not dissimilar circumstances from my own. So uh, that that's not really the ideal way to start an open source project. <laughs> yeah, and as far as I know, they never rewrote it. It's just you, know, you can just see the... Uh, you know, it's kind of like the ruins of Troy, 13 layers of slag, one on top of the other. So you started this around 1997. When did you start to build, you know, significant traffic? Uh, we, I guess I don't know how you define significant. We were, we were pretty big, pretty fast, uh, but I guess that's all relative. Uh, uh, I was very active in the IRC community uh, for the Linux uh, space. I was a open source developer. I was writing code and contributing to various platforms. And my site, even before Slashdot existed, had a certain percent, a certain amount of traffic. But you know, uh, that would be like you know hundreds or thousands of users a day. So Slashdot itself, when it came out, when it started, was just me saying all of my stuff is here now, uh, and it had thousands of people almost immediately. Uh, but, uh, it grew to tens of thousands, uh, in a few months, uh, and hundreds of thousands, uh, within, uh, within a year or two. Um, we were, uh, very fortunate. Uh, I can't, I don't have a lot of advice in terms of how you would grow such a thing except for to do the right thing and don't be dumb. Uh, it seems like that's a lesson that a lot of websites don't really understand anymore, but you know, <laughs> Yeah, hey, let's also be honest. Be the right place at the right time, right? 1997, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? And uh, as I said uh, in the opener, uh, it was kind of the must-read source for serious biz tech nerds uh, in the day, right? Uh, whenever there was some hack or some new policy issue that uh, was arising, first place I went, slash dot. For uh, for a good five years there, uh, we were, I wouldn't say the only game in town, but we were head and shoulders above the rest because your other choices would be the mainstream tech publications. And they were, they very much uh, grew out of the traditional print media. So they had, uh, they had a certain flavor to them. Uh, I wouldn't call them stale, lame and boring, but uh, I just did. Uh, other people but, might, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, now, yeah, it was interesting. And, uh, but then on the other hand, Eventually, it started to fade. I still sort of recall when I first noticed it fading. It was, you know, by this point, I'd retired from business in 2001 and had reinvented myself as a scientist. And I was out at the Santa Fe Institute doing uh, research on agent based evolutionary artificial intelligence. How about that for a mouthful? But I still had some, you know, uh, tech investments and still advised I was on a few boards and what have you. Remember, something came up and I immediately went to Slashdot and said, Slashdot should be the place to learn about this. This was about 2003, 2004. And there was hardly anything there. And what was there was a little weak. And then I discovered Ars Technica. And that then became my kind of go-to place around that time. Yeah, ours was, ours was solid for a long time there. 
Yeah, uh, I would say Slashdot held on uh, its relevance uh, up until uh, the era of Dig and Reddit. Uh, I, once they started achieving a certain amount of traction, Slashdot lost uh, some of its luster. Uh, but there was a lot going on, uh, and the new, uh, more uh, I guess the more modern crowdsourced. Uh, flavors became more popular. Uh, and along with that, I think uh, Slashdot began to gently set into the sun. Well, yes, that happens sometimes. Anyway, let's get to the point uh, that uh, you know Peter Wang and I were talking about, uh, at least back in the day, as I recall, and who knows, maybe I'm getting senile, but I recall that you had a rating system where people were selected somehow uh, at, in relatively low frequency to rate the stories. Uh, was that is that correct? Did I remember that right? Well, uh, I might nitpick uh, on your terminology. Uh, Slashdot was always a the the story selection process. When you say stories, uh, I think about the story selection process, and I think you're trying to describe the comment moderation process. Uh, we always took story submissions from uh, our users. Right. Uh, in the later eras, uh, in the later era, the 2007 range, let's say, uh, there was a voting system where the community could participate in the story selection process. Uh, but uh, within about a, maybe a year and change of Slashdot's existence, the comment moderation system was very much in active development. Uh, and I think that's probably the piece that, uh, that most people think of when they think about uh, Slashdot and its role uh, in large scale discussion systems. I mean, there weren't a lot of systems uh, in uh, 1998, 1999 that would potentially have hundreds of active contributors uh, posting uh, within a few hours uh, and also allowed a- uh, anonymity within the context of the platform. So our system uh, was uh, uniquely evolved to deal with the problems that we saw. Yeah, okay, I think you're right. Yeah, now you know, again, this was a while ago, and I'm getting old. God damn it! Uh, and uh, so it was the it was the uh, the comment moderation that you picked people. It, it was not everybody got the vote. People right. were picked for short periods of time, like a couple of days. Yep. And and you had I don't I don't know, did you have a limited number of votes? I don't even remember, but I still yeah. remember be, being selected several times and taking it seriously. Because it was a high-powered signal, you know, unlike a like on Facebook or an upvote right. on Reddit, what you think of as a cheap signal. If you got tapped uh, with this limited uh, period uh, franchise, you actually took it seriously. You know, why don't you explain how that system worked? Yeah, scarcity uh, creates value. Uh, the way that the system generally worked is that uh, you had to be. Uh, an active participant within the community, uh, which I had a number of different uh, metrics that I would measure uh, to decide if you were able to participate or not. One of the things was you got to read the site and you can't read too much. Uh, so there was sort of a sweet spot. You had to read the, pay, the the site more than a couple of times a day and you had to read the site less than, let's say, I'll pick a number 50 times a day. Uh, if you were that, then we then the concern would be that you were trying to game the system and get points uh, intentionally, and we absolutely had to deal with that problem later on. Uh, but the system would um, basically dole out eligibility tokens uh, if you happened to be, if you fell within the the window of people who were good contributors during that time window. And when the system, so basically, the, as users would post comments, we would push eligibility tokens into the system, and once. Uh, enough comments had been in the system, we would pull whoever had the most tokens uh, out of the pile uh, and give them mod points. So that would actually amount to, uh, you know, a few hundred people a day uh, or maybe a few thousand people a day, depending on the era, getting mod points, Uh, at which point uh, the specifics would vary depending on whether you're talking about 1998 or 2008. But you'd get, let's say, five or ten points, and you were usually given 24, 48, 72 hours to spend them. Uh, at which point you would read the comments and you would find the ones you liked and you could choose to send them up a point or down a point. And I mean, at the core, that's the whole system. Uh, We had uh, scarcity, uh, which created urgency. uh, And over time, we were able to identify 
uh, users who were bad actors and users who were good actors within the system and sort of uh, adjust some levers to make sure that the right people were getting the points at the right time and the, the bad actors got weeded out of the system. And we were able to get to a place where we were able to spend, we were able to generate a community that could spend, you know, thousands of points within the system a day, which was usually enough. I, I, I tried to maintain a ratio of comment posts to moderator activity. Uh, and that, that, that kind of was the sweet spot. Whereas today when you see a, you know, a tweet or a, uh, a Reddit post, uh, with, uh, with your likes or whatever, uh, that's essentially an infinite resource. You can have a tweet with, uh, with 10 million likes on it. Uh, but the system, the slash dot system was designed, uh, to not actually have that, uh, because I always felt that, uh, the scarcity is what, uh, what made the system re- kind of reliable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the time when I was most active on Slashdot, I was the CEO of a billion dollar company, right? My time was precious. Uh, but when I got those little taps, uh, you know, I took it seriously and I actually uh, uh, said, okay, here's some significant signal uh, in the community that I respect. And so I did it and I paid a lot of attention to it. And so I think that was, uh, you know, damn clever design. Uh, the other thing that's nice about it is it defeats some of the game theoretical hacks on open rating systems. I mean, uh, famously, Reddit is where brigading got started, right? It was, I can still remember the uh, shit Reddit says versus the anti shit Reddit says brigade wars, where hundreds of people would attack each other's posts and uprate them or downrate them, et cetera. Uh, your system seemed uh, pretty damn uh, resilient against brigading, as an example. You know, it's interesting is that uh, I said this earlier, but uh, uh, in the later noughties, we developed a system to rate stories and uh, to sort of leverage uh, our population in the story selection process. But I wasn't comfortable simply flipping the switch and using a model like a like a Reddit or a dig where the community votes exclusively determine the content content of the homepage. And uh when that happened, we saw a lot of that brigading style attacks uh, on this uh, this new system, which didn't have the same scarcity of moderation. But uh, I had designed that system uh, to avoid it, uh, rather than revealing, for example, specific uh, integer values for uh, the posts, uh, I color coded them. Uh, so, uh, the color codes underneath the hood could represent, uh, any number they, it could be a million likes, or it could be seven, uh, if it was the right seven, uh, but, uh, or the right, like if, an, if I moderated it up, that was worth more than you. Cause sorry, Jim, you're a nice guy, but, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I know what I like and I know what's going on slash dot. Uh, but, uh, the, the system, we've absolutely had that brigading type material the behavior in that system. And that the development of that, of the, the story rating system, very much was influenced by the successes that we had had with the moderation system. I was trying to find a hybrid uh, between the two, between the more public uh, Reddit type systems, uh, which are easily gameable. Uh, or relatively easily gameable. Uh, and I, what I found actually is that some of the worst offenders for the brigading style tactics were actually the publishers themselves. Uh, they would routinely, uh, m- get into our system. We called it the fire hose. They would get into the fire hose and they would, uh, moderate themselves up, uh, and they would, uh, send their rivals down. Like the worst would be like an embargoed news tech release, uh, where, you know, you got five, you got your Ars Technicas and you got your PC magazines and they've all got the same embargoed news story coming out at 1201 and they would all log in and moderate their own story up and their rival publications down. And that would just be like, you know, a dozen people. Uh, but it was very much, uh, I think at that, that was kind of the era where I realized, oh, great, the publications are just as crappy as the randos. Uh, and, uh, it, it took me a little while to realize that the governments would be doing the exact same thing. And that's where we see our, the, the Twitters in, uh, the mid 2015s or the Facebooks, uh, where now you have government actors doing what, uh, what, uh, might've been being done by Anand tech or something in 2007. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and again, this is what you should expect. Game theory, right? Uh, you give you give uh, agents an ecosystem and they will attempt to fucking manipulate it. You know, I'll confess to, 
in the early days when I was, I wouldn't call it the early days of Reddit, but the early days when I was on Reddit, I had a dozen sock puppets, right? Uh, quite handy to kick your uh, kick your posts up a little bit, particularly in not so traffic subreddits, right? You, you give yourself sure. a dozen upvotes over six or seven hours, and uh, it definitely helped. Of course, people are going to do that. Yeah, that'd be a really good way to get uh, your accounts to stop working on Slashdot. Yep, exactly. And so well, that's the thing is that we spent we spent years developing defensive techniques against those sorts of uh, those sorts of behaviors. Uh, and I actually felt a little bad for the Reddits and the Digs because uh, when they started gaining traction uh, and popularity, those sorts of behaviors just became immediately obvious. And the the users of those systems, the comment posters, had. Uh, developed these techniques on Slashdot, and we had spent years hardening ourselves, ourselves against them. Uh, so when uh, the when the next generation, the Web 2.0 generation, came along, I felt bad because uh, the the troll population uh, was coming to, to the battle with machine guns, and they were they were defending themselves with uh, you know two by fours and, and sticks. <laughs> and they still are. Right? I mean, frankly, you can you can still manipulate both Reddit and Twitter fairly easily. Although I would I would actually argue that now it seems like the people who are working on the bots are are as much they're they're working with psychology uh, as much as anything else they're they're they know what stuff is gonna bite on people uh, and they're, they're really careful about that I think that uh, you know 15 years ago it was less about the psychology and more about just trying to make your point heard. Uh, and now it's a lot more savvy, a lot more malicious, I suppose. Yeah, it's a, another game that's opened up. You know, the old uh, the old game of upvoting still exists. Brigading still exists. I know a guy who has an army of trolls, for instance, right? And he's real active right now, uh, manipulating things in the uh, presidential elections. And so, uh, yeah, there's <clears throat> robot posting for sure. Uh, but good old brigading still exists, and you know it's a it's as always an arm arms race. Platforms are trying to detect it, but hey, you run it through Tor, so they don't know where the hell you're coming from, and you know, and and you know, but then they say, all right, now the people's IPs addresses are evolving in a non-standard fashion. That ain't right. So then you start using Ghost, where you can you know come out where you want. You know, ah, you are ah. you're giving me flashbacks because what you are basically describing was my day to day job from like 2000 till 2000. 2006, 2007. Oh, great. They figured out a new way to obfuscate their identity. And Slashdot at its core, we really worked hard during my tenure to maintain the ability to post anonymity or to post anonymously. Uh, and that's not something I think that exists anymore. And I think that, you, I mean, whether or not that's a, that's a value is a different discussion. Uh, but uh we valued it at the time, and that made it very difficult uh, for uh, for us to have a lot of defenses against folks because, like you say, Tor. Or, I mean, even before Tor, um, unsecured relay servers that was our that was our first problem. Un, uh, unsecured proxy servers, uh, and then that would evolve into Tor, and then we had people who would uh, they would bot the creation of user accounts. Uh, and uh, so that they could get around the, we, we would throttle anonymous users in, 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 you know, maybe a little bit more rigidly than regular users. Cause I couldn't tell if you were one user or 50 uh, without enough data. Uh, so we would, I don't know. It, it was, a, it was a difficult time. Uh, and uh, it gave me a good sense of what the folks uh, that are at the major platforms are dealing with today. Uh, and uh, it's a bummer because uh, they got overwhelmed uh, and I think that now that everybody's aware that that's a problem, uh, it's, it's a little bit too late. The cat's kind of out of the bag for those folks. Yeah, sort of, but you know, nothing says they couldn't change their moderations, uh, policy. Well, go ahead. Moderation policies, but, uh, but, uh, it's, it's, it's about, uh, user expectation. Uh, and I think that, uh, you, but users of these systems, uh, like for, let, here's a dumb example. Uh, the fact that the the like count on Twitter is displayed as a numeric integer creates a whole number of perverse incentives for bad actors and for good actors. But it but they can't take that number away in 2020. People would freak. Uh, but you know that number is probably damaging to them. If they simply replaced that with percentiles and said this comments in the 99th percentile for today, uh, a lot of like, edge case behavior would go away. Uh, but it also at the lower levels would take away 
uh, incentive because uh, moving to uh, you know the from the zero to the first percentile is actually a pretty big burden for for most online content. Yep. Although actually, Jack has mused about getting rid of the count. Right? He's talked about it and. Uh, at one point said he was going to. He didn't actually, but uh, yeah, I wonder you know, why. They're, at least, they're at least thinking about it, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, a couple they say that all the time. Uh, I think that uh, they're all doing their best in a in a questionable situation, but these decisions are hard and they have influence uh, at the at the street level where you just have like a random three people tweeting back and forth at each other, but also at the the state actor level. Uh, these are hard, hard problems, and if you haven't been neck deep in it, uh, you don't understand the complexities of them. And you know, I, I wish them all the best. Uh, I wish they would have. I wish they would have hired me for like one day of consulting in like 2008, so I could sit down with them and say, "Look, these are what this is. What's going to happen to you? Uh, you need to harden against this now." But, you know. Yep. And again, they should have just known that any ecosystem that has targets of value that can be exploited will be exploited, right? And you discovered many of them, though probably not all of them. Oh, definitely not. Uh, we, were to start, we were discovering new ones right up until the day left. Yep. Uh, is there anybody out there that's using the uh, you know high value, scarce uh, moderation technique that you guys had? Yeah, no, I haven't seen, well, nobody's using our specifics. Uh, uh, I imagine there are systems out there that, uh, that use them, but they're probably... The notions that we're playing with probably have more in common with video games uh, than uh, uh, like a moderation system. You know, things like running out of ammo and stuff uh, in a in a in a in a game. You know, has a lot to do with you know. Do we add more ammo and more weapons to make this map more fun, or does that create this make this map be uh, imbalanced? towards a certain play style. I think that uh, the gaming community probably deals with these sorts of problems more uh, than the Reddit communities because the, I think that uh, the the larger scale systems, they're so focused on maximizing time on site uh, that the notion that you would throttle uh, an interactive behavior uh, is is a difficult one because when you, I mean, what, what are you doing except uh, designing metrics and measuring success with your various metrics uh, and what tells you that uh, that a user is enjoying your system more than them clicking a like button? That's a big deal. Uh, uh, and so th- they 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 have a different incentive. Uh, so I don't know. It's it's a it's a hard problem. Uh, I've never seen anybody uh, deploy things like at, at to the extreme scale that we did. There are plenty of systems that restrict moderator access, uh, but they generally do so to tiers or classes of users, and not to. Uh, I mean, the Slashdot system was very much designed to give everybody a shot. Uh, like, I, like I'm going to test you out. Welcome to the system. You've been around for a couple of months. I'm going to test you out a couple of times. And if you prove yourself worthy, then you're going to get to participate in the system uh, every couple of weeks. And if you don't, then you're not going to have to play anymore. Yeah, great. It was a great idea. It really was. I, uh, and that's what that's actually the conversation Peter and I were having. Said, hmm, this was an actually interesting, different, and at the time, seemingly effective uh, way to do moderation. And we, at least, had never seen it elsewhere. I think that uh, I mean the the systems today they suffer with a with another uh, a number of uh, interesting hamstrings on this regard as well. Uh, one of Slashdot's key advantages in the early days is that the community was really friggin' smart, uh, and the topic uh, of the site was relatively narrow. Uh, it was all generally tech or sci-fi or I mean it was news for nerds. It was it was that that vein uh and especially for the first few years uh they're just we weren't talking about uh the, the general things that you would see like on uh, a national debate stage uh we were talking about a niche uh and so if uh you're an expert uh in operating systems uh then your your opinion on uh hardware and on, on video cards might be reasonably accurate uh but just because you're an expert in uh, encryption doesn't make you an expert in immigration policy uh, and I think that the, the modern systems suffer from uh, you're, you're expected to be all things or people tend to be or to, to, per, to portray themselves as being expert in all things when they're online. So if I'm logged in on Reddit uh, or Twitter, uh, whether or not I'm uh, uh, participating in uh, the uh, PC sales subreddit or 
uh, the Donald, I suppose the Donald's not around no more, but, uh, but, but regardless, the system regards me as being generally equal, uh, in each of these areas, although I'm maybe more of an expert in one subject than the other. Uh, and I think that that's really where we end up in so much trouble with the, with the Twitter these days is that you have a person who's an expert and they have a, they have a domain of expertise and they gain followers because they have a, a domain expertise. And then that allows their ideas outside of their expertise uh, to be weighed uh, with uh, an undeserved value uh, because of their expertise in another domain. Uh, and so therefore, because they were successful in attracting followers from uh, their domain expertise area, uh, their uh, opinions on areas where they're not, they're simply not qualified, gain likes, uh, they gain, they, they gain unearned popularity. Uh, and I think that a slash dot uh, it had a lot of advantage because at least in the earlier days, the community was relatively focused uh, on t- on subject matter. So we had a, we had a good advantage there. As we broadened out and added things like politics and stuff to the site, I think that 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 uh, became more of a problem. Uh, but the the modern systems, they don't have anything like that. Uh, on Twitter, you can follow me because you're interested in seeing me make pens. You can follow me because you're interested in uh, my podcast, Geeks in Space. Or you can follow me because you're interested in my opinions on social media and modern day use of moderation systems. Uh, but uh, uh, my my qualifications on any of these things has nothing to do with the fact uh, my my qualification for if I happen to tweet that the Detroit Tigers won today, uh, and obviously these are trivial examples, but people use them for legitimately important matters of discussion, and the systems don't seem to differentiate uh, between the two. Yeah, and you talk about uh, cross uh, leverage of expertise, and of course on Twitter the even bigger problem is no expertise, you know, so-called celebrities, you know, they got 9 million followers and they mouth off on all kinds of topics and they have no expertise in anything. They're just famous for being well-known, the definition of being a celebrity, right? And that's the thing is that, uh, uh, you know, the Kanye West problem, I suppose, he may very well be an expert uh, in something that he tweets about, uh, but he's famous for something else. And I have no way to vet his uh, credibility uh, on a subject that maybe he's never really actively participated before. And that's that's sort of universally true. You shouldn't uh, trust my views on any political matter. I have no particular expertise in politics. Uh, my background is, is generally technology and social media. Uh, you shouldn't trust what I think about, I don't know, immigration policy or international relations. I don't have any, but I might tweet about it. Uh, but if you're voting that up, you know, it's not because I'm qualified. <laughs> yep. Indeed. That's a, you know, that's an interesting design issue if one were thinking about how to do something like social media correctly. Uh, one of the things you mentioned, which I did not know at the time, was that you had uh, differential vote weights uh, on Slashdot. You know, we were considering that in our 2013 uh, system. In fact, it was kind of a stupid and naive first attempt, which we never actually implemented, but we'd specced out uh, making the up and down votes. Uh, you'll love this. Uh, weighted by the log five of your Reddit style karma. How about that for an obscure algorithm? It's not Looney Tunes. Uh, we we did lots of variations on that. Uh, so in the initial days of Slashdot scores, the scores of comments were rated from negative one to five, and the the the, the database entry was literally just an integer. Uh, and it was literally just sum it all up, add and subtract when people participated. Uh, over time, that became uh, not nearly com- or not nearly good enough because you have all sorts of weird cases. Like, for example, there's a difference between a comment that's a score five and then somebody tries to moderate it up to six. Uh, and then it so it flutters five six five six five six five six. What does that mean uh, to a user and to the moderators? Uh, I didn't I didn't like that because I was trying to balance the number of points being spent in the system on any given day. Uh, but there's there's that's a signal there and I have to capitalize on that. Uh, when we designed the achievement system for Slashdot, uh, we sort of modeled it after the way that World of Warcraft did theirs. But as a joke, uh, we made each of the tiers of um, of your rating, of your achievement, of your score in the achievement system, uh, each each was exponential. It wasn't log five; it was exponential. So uh, to you know get to rank eight or whatever in an achievement category, it had to be two to the eighth. 
uh, uh, points uh, or uh, events uh, that measured that. So there, there were there were a number of uh, achievements in the system that uh, you know you'd suddenly find yourself. Well, you got to post sixteen million comments in order yeah. to get to the next tier because it's exponential. Yeah, log two, basically. That's basically log two, right? Uh, and log five is even worse, right? Right. And so we did. We did essentially a similar thing uh, because I didn't want people to treat that as a gameable thing. So at some point, uh, the difference between you know, if you're talking about uh, like an easy, like a free action, like a like or something uh, on Reddit, um, you know, if a user has done that a hundred thousand times over the course of a year, whether or not they do it a hundred thousand times or two hundred thousand times doesn't really matter all that much. That you know, the the difference between you know that those the orders of magnitude are really all that matters at that point. That's exactly why we we like the log the logarithmic scale because it does it you know it's essentially the inverse of the exponential. So uh, it's exactly that reason, you know, the difference between one hundred thousand. And two hundred thousand posts is much more di- much different than between twenty posts and a hundred thousand posts. Right. the The actual comment moderation system on Slashdot uh, didn't exactly use that, uh, but uh, we definitely like. By the end, we had a lot. The, the system underneath is actually pretty complicated. When I left, uh, and I can't imagine that it's changed much uh, in the last eight nine years, but. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of weird math going on, on underneath there. Uh, like to deal with like weird, weird edge cases. Like for example, what happens if I find a bot, uh, in the system, uh, and, uh, I discover that that bot has been doing something crappy in my system for two weeks and I didn't notice, well, uh, I, the system that we had actually had the ability to extract that user from the system, I could erase their scores. And that might mean like a lot of weird stuff. Like the example I was talking about earlier, you got a score five comment that gets moderated up to six, but slash that doesn't have score six. So it's just four, five, four, five, four, five, six, five, four, five, bouncing around in that range. Well, what happens when you pull somebody out uh, pull somebody's influence out of that like a, like a week later? Well, that comment isn't getting active moderation. Uh, so you actually have to replay uh, the moderation history uh, that occurred to that individual comment and see that this guy who, uh, you know, you might have weighted him as a 100% contributing user uh, a week ago, but now you realize he's a 0% contributor. You got you to gotta make sure that uh, you keep the score fair uh, to the to the user who uh, posted the comment. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, and I don't think people really think through the complexities of this stuff unless they are neck deep in it for a few years. Yeah, and of course, uh, it'd be even harder to implement something like that on the scale of uh, Twitter or Facebook, where uh, instead of you know hundreds of thousands or a few millions uh, of users, you're talking about billions, right? For sure, and they have the the further problem where, um, uh, like like I was saying earlier, you know, your post in one domain of expertise. Uh, you could get retweeted tomorrow by somebody whose whose followers all exist within a completely different domain of expertise. So a lot of your uh, a lot of the historical value uh, gets thrown out the window. It's 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 a complicated problem, uh, and I would absolutely uh, I would love l- full access to those guys' log files. I'd love to I'd love to par- parse that data and see what see what's going on. Have you ever reached out to them to uh, you know, offer your expertise and or get access to their data for research purposes? They do occasionally give it out. Uh, I have uh, academic friends who do that sort of thing, uh, but nobody at Twitter or Facebook knows my name, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, I had a guy, Philip Howard, on from Oxford who uh, leads the social media analysis uh, uh, group over at Oxford, and they do uh, stuff like that. And I had on actually just last week, Renee Darista, who does something very similar at Stanford. Uh, you know, if you'd like to be introduced to those folks, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, you should. Uh, you might want to talk to Cliff Lampy at uh, University of Michigan. He does a lot of that stuff too. Sounds good. So let's finish the story. Uh, what happened? To, what happened with Slashdot? Uh, why did Hacker News kick your ass? <laughs> uh, Hacker News never kicked our ass. Hacker News is a different deal entirely. Um, well, I think Slashdot uh, became victim of its own success. Uh, we, uh, the, when the site began, it was a very dedicated population of contributors uh, who were generally expert uh, in the the areas of the nerd culture that we were doing, that we were covering. 
And uh, over the years, uh, other choices came along. And uh, when a population starts off with a core of experts, the inevitable thing that happens is that a secondary population of, of uh, hangers-on uh, uh, moves into the, uh, into the system as well. And uh, I think that uh, over the course of a few years, uh, a lot of the expert folks got pretty annoyed by the noobs uh, and other possibilities came out too. Uh, what happens like Reddit and Twitter, uh, and I guess before, before those to a certain extent dig, uh, they, they created a different kind of incentive for users because the story selection process that those platforms used uh, was driven entirely or mostly entirely by the, the, the users themselves, which meant that those systems can be faster. Uh, a tweet uh, that I make right now goes out to all of my followers within a second. Uh, and they are limited only by how fast they can refresh or how often they refresh Twitter on any given day. Slashdot had itself limited to, you know, let's say a dozen, a dozen articles a day, a dozen stories a day. So if you want more than 12 stories a day, or if you are more interested and you want to deep dive into a specific area, well, that's not going to work too well for you on Slashdot. So the, uh, the, the Reddits and the Twitters allowed the power user to get more of what they wanted, and it allowed them to get it faster. Uh, and once the power users started figuring that out, well, the power users started losing interest uh, in Slashdot, because at that point, they have to jump through the editorial hoop created by the Slashdot editorial process itself. Uh, and that's that's legit and fair, and I, I would do the same in their shoes, most likely. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, you play that forward for a few years, and you lose 5, 10, 15, 20% of your original audience uh, for that reason. And then what you have left is a, is a bit of a hollow shell compared to what you had before. So it wasn't so much uh, a collapse as much as it was a slow, sad death by attrition. Um, and uh, I don't think that Hacker News kicked our butt. Uh, I would actually say that uh, Dig knocked us off our pedestal. Uh, Reddit did it, did it mostly right. Uh, Twitter's a different beast. Uh, I mean, Twitter and Reddit and Facebook are, I guess, the dominant platforms now, and they each succeed and fail along a very specific vector. Uh, but they each have very clear advantages out of uh, over Slashdot, even without talking about the 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 scale advantages that you have. Uh, because the other thing to keep in mind is that with Slashdot, I very very consciously worked my butt off to keep it. Uh, within a very specific sphere of, of, of domain expertise. I didn't want Slashdot covering stuff that was outside of the News for Nerds, nerds umbrella. Uh, and if you want something that's not the news in, under the News for Nerds umbrella, you got to go somewhere else. And I think that uh, that was Slashdot's advantage, but it had the, uh, the negative side effect that that anybody who's going to be reading Slashdot in 2008 was probably reading Slashdot in 1998. And the thing about people is that we can't make more people that were reading Slashdot in 1998. That's a fixed pool that can only shrink. Uh, so the only way that you can grow your population is to broaden uh, your domain of expertise uh, or lower your standards. Uh, and I wasn't really comfortable with either of those options. Uh, and I don't know what's happening over there today, but uh, I imagine probably more of the same. Interesting. Well, Rob, thank you very much for a uh, walk through the history of one of the more important uh, web sites of that era. Uh, I was particularly enjoyed uh, jumping into more of the details and how your comment moderation system worked. And you know, I hope some listeners out there who work at some of these platform companies or have influence on them might say, hey, maybe they ought to talk to this guy, Rob, right? He's, uh, he's been through this shit before. It may not be directly applicable, but uh, some of this thinking, uh, I suspect, would help these uh, platform companies do a better job on what they're trying to do today. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I pretty much think I'm the world's greatest uh, and that they should all be paying me as a highly paid consultant on all of these matters. Uh, I mean, but I might have some biases. Yeah, it's, it's just possible, just like I think my granddaughter's got to be the most beautiful baby in the world, right? I, I, I have no reason to believe otherwise. All righty. So if you want to ca catch up on what Rob's thinking or at least babbling about, you can catch him up on uh, 
Geeks in Space podcast, available on your favorite podcast app, I'm imagining. Probably. I honestly don't know. I've never heard it. <laughs> yeah, frankly, I won't tell you how many times I listen to my podcast, but it ain't many. Uh, anyway, thanks, Rob, and this was fun. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.